first amino acid is called as the N-terminal amino acid and the last amino acid that makes up the protein is called as the C-terminal amino acid. So ester bonds is usually seen in the nucleotides that is either the deoxyribonucleotide or the ribonucleotide. So glycosidic bond usually occurs in polysaccharides. There are two types of polysaccharides, right? Simple polysaccharides and complex polysaccharides. Hello everyone, a warm welcome to another session on chapter 9 that is biomolecules. I'm Dr. Divya, biology faculty with Yashram Pre University College, Mysore, Temple of Excellence. So in the previous session, we had studied about the structure of proteins in general, wherein I had told you that proteins are made up of chains of amino acids. And we also studied about the polysaccharides, wherein the polysaccharides are made up of more than one monomer units of the monosaccharides. And we also studied a little bit about the nucleic acids, wherein we studied that nucleic acids are made up of different nitrogenous bases which are attached to the phosphate group and one of the sucrose sugars. And in today's session, we shall study about the structure of the protein in detail, wherein we shall study about the primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary structure of the proteins. And we also, we will study about the different types of bonds that actually links the monomer units in the proteins as well as uh, in the polysaccharides, as well as in the nucleic acids. We shall start with structure of protein. So, if you recall, in the previous session, I had told you proteins are made up of chains of 20 different amino acids, be it serine, cysteine, thymine, then we have adenine, then comes amino acids such as the cysteine, the lysine, the serine, all these arginine, all these different amino acids they are made up of. And therefore, because they are made up of different types of amino acids, they are called as the hetero polymers and they are heteropolymers and they are made up of strings of amino acids which are arranged in a linear form. So as you can see here, it is made up of strings of amino acids. So this is one amino acid and this is one more, one more which is held together by peptide bonds. They are made up of strings of amino acids and if you imagine a protein as a linear arrangement or as a line, the left and end is represented by the first amino acid. So this forms the first amino acid and the right end it forms the last amino acid. So therefore it is made up of the first amino acid and where the protein ends it is the last amino acid. It is represented by the last amino acid. So the first amino acid is called as the end terminal amino acid and the last amino terminal. Why? Because it is present at one terminus one end therefore it is called as the end terminal amino acid and the last amino acid is called as the C terminal amino acid therefore when you look at the structure of a protein it is a heteropolymer wherein it is made up of chains of different amino acids which are held together by peptide bonds and these chains of amino acid first amino acid is called as the N terminal amino acid and the last amino acid that makes up the protein is called as the C terminal amino acid. So there are different types of proteins or different levels of protein structure. So if uh, we have the primary structure, the secondary structure, the tertiary structure and the quaternary structure. So primary structure, when you look at a protein, it is made up of chains of amino acids in a linear arrangement. That is the primary structure of the protein. So the sequence of amino acid that is the positional information in a protein which is the first amino acid which is the second and so on is the primary structure of the protein. Say for example here we can see this is the primary structure of the protein wherein you can see say this is the first amino acid this is the second third fourth fifth sixth that is the last amino acid you can tell the number of amino acids easily by looking at it and we can tell the position of the amino acid saying that this is the first this is the second this is the third why because it is arranged in a line it is a linear arrangement 
such an arrangement is called as the primary structure of the protein. So the primary structure of the protein is nothing but the sequence of amino acids which are arranged in a linear form or in the form of line wherein you can easily tell which is the first amino acid, which is the second, which is the third and so on. It is called as the primary structure of the protein. Next moving on to the secondary structure of a protein. So I told you a protein is a thread. So thread can have folds, right? So here, a protein thread does not exist throughout as an extended rigid rod. So don't think that the protein is continuously like this, like a thread. So there is a thread. You have seen threads, right? For sweeping purpose and all threads are being used. How neatly they would have wound a thread around something, right? So that thread, when you pull it out, that string that you get in a linear arrangement, it is the linear primary structure of the protein. Now, I, I am rolling that linear arrangement around something. Now, there is a coil-like arrangement that is the secondary structure of the protein. Therefore, protein thread is not continuously linear throughout. In between somewhere, the thread is folded in the form of a helix, like a helix. Like how it is, as you can see here, like a thread, it is folded like a helix. So this folding is nothing but the secondary structure of the protein. When this folding occurs, it is difficult for us to distinguish which is the first amino acid, which is the second amino acid. Therefore, such a structure is called as the secondary structure of protein. So it's just like a staircase. So you, you might have seen in Mysuzu and all that, right? There is a beautiful staircase which is in a spiral form like this. Usually staircase, how it is? Just one stretch, ladder, it is a primary structure. I can tell you, I can give you the example of a ladder. Ladder is a primary structure of protein. You can say which is the first step, second step, third step and all that. But in a spiral staircase, you will. it is difficult to understand which is the first, which is the second. So that is one example for a primary structure of protein. It is just like a spiral staircase or it is like a thread that is woven around something. So that is the primary structure. And only some portion of the proteins are arranged in the form of a helix. In proteins, only right-handed helices are observed. Other regions of the protein thread are folded into other forms which is called as the secondary structure. So it is nothing but different forms. You can see here there is alpha helix structure wherein they are folded into different forms. So this folding that is present, these linear proteins itself in some of the portion they get folded like how a, like a, a spiral staircase or like a thread that is woven around something. So that particular structure is called as the secondary structure. They have a helical arrangement. It looks like a DNA, right? DNA is also a helical arrangement like this. Sometimes it is linear, sometimes it is folded, linear, folded, it has folded structures. So therefore, it is nothing but they are called as the secondary structures. Next, moving on to one more structure, which is the tertiary structure. Again, in the protein itself, apart from having a linear structure and in between having a secondary structure, there is also one more structure called as a tertiary structure. So again, the secondary structural proteins again winds. They will not have a proper helical structure. So here what happens, along protein chains, they get folded upon itself like how in a wool. So there is difference between a thread and a wool. If you remember, wool, it is just like that rolled around a ball. But thread, it is neatly rolled around something that is tubular, right? But wool is rolled around a ball. So how the rolling will occur somewhat like this, the wool will look. It is rolled like this. So this is nothing but the tertiary structure. So here... The long protein chains, they get folded upon itself like a hollow woolen ball, like how the woolen ball looks like, right? Just like that, the proteins get folded upon each other itself. But threads, they are neatly wound around something. But here, the wool, they actually 
uh, rolls around itself many times. So, such a structure is called as the tertiary structure. So, when you look at it, it gives a three dimensional structure. So, which is the type of protein that looks like a three dimensional structure? It is the tertiary protein. So, this gives a three dimensional view of a protein and tertiary protein is very very important for the protein to attain a definite shape. So, you can say this protein has this particular shape only if it is in a tertiary structure. So, tertiary structure not just that, it is also important for many biological activities to take place in a organism properly. This tertiary structure of the protein is very very important. Next, talking about the quaternary structure. So, quaternary structure is nothing but here primary structure there is no folding at all. It is a linear structure. Secondary structure in between some places there are folding occurring. Tertiary structure, it completely forms a helical structure. That is a tertiary structure. Completely or full protein thread is helical in nature. It is called, it is a tertiary structure. Now, quaternary structure here, some proteins are assembled in more than one polypeptide or subunit. Say for example, here we have a tertiary structure. Again, somewhere here there is one tertiary structure. Here again, there is some tertiary structure. So, this is nothing but the quaternary structure. So, the manner in which each individual proteins, they are folded into different subunits, it forms a linear string of spheres. The spheres are arranged one upon each other in the form of cube or plate-like structures. It is called as the quaternary structure of a protein. So, as you can see here, this is one particular fold. Again here, one particular fold. Again here, the fold will continue like this. There are many folds, many subunits of proteins which are folded into a tertiary structure. So, those together forms a quaternary structure of the protein. So, this is about the quaternary structure of the protein. So, therefore, there are four different types of protein. One is the primary structure, the secondary structure, the tertiary structure and the quaternary structure. So, I hope you have understood what the quaternary structure is. One subunit of protein completely folds, it is folded. The next subunit again it is folded, it folds, it folded, folded, folded forming a plate like arrangement. So, that is nothing but the quaternary structure of the protein. So, next moving on to the Example of quaternary structure of protein. So, for quaternary structure of protein, one of the best example is the hemoglobin that is present in the adult human being. So, hemoglobin consists of four subunits of proteins, wherein two subunits are identical to each other. So, two subunits are same, the other two subunits are same. So, two of these are identical to each another. Hence, these two subunits are called as the alpha type and two subunits are of the beta type. So, best example. So, we have the alpha type subunit and the beta type subunit. So, these two alpha types and these two will be the beta type subunits. So, these are the quaternary structure of the protein. So, the subunits are folded multiple times to form one unit of protein. Therefore, here two of the subunits are similar to look like which are called as the alpha subunit. Two of the subunits are similar to look like which are called as the beta subunit and these together form the quaternary structure of the protein. And one of the best example for quaternary structure of protein is the hemoglobin that is present in the blood of the adult human being. So, this is one of the important examples for quaternary structure of. So, next we shall study about the nature of bond linking monomers in a polymer. So, if you have understood in the previous session I had told you the proteins they are made up of monomer units right and if you take the example of nucleic acids they also they are connected to one end to the ribosugar or the deoxyribosugar and to the other end they are connected to a phosphate molecule. So, therefore, how are they bonded to each other? How does the linking take place? It is based on different types of bonds that are present. So, we shall see what are the different types of bonds that are present. If it is a polysaccharide, what are the different types of bonds that link a monomer unit? If it is a protein, what are the different types of bonds that 
link the amino acid units and all that we shall see. So we shall study about the nature of different types of bonds that links the monomer units in order for them to form a polymeric chain like structure. So first we shall see about the peptide bond. So a peptide bond. So say for an example, the amino in a protein, protein is made up of chains of different amino acids, right? 20 different amino acids form a chain to form a protein. So how are each amino acid? Say for example, we have a amino acid cysteine serine. So again here, we have amino acid lysine. So how are they linked to one another? There should be a bond like in chemistry you have you might have studied the hydrogen bonds how they help in linking the molecules and all that right just like that here also there should be a bond that is being formed so how is it linked it is linked by the peptide bond so this bond is nothing but the peptide bond so in a polypeptide or in a protein Amino acids are linked together by a peptide bond and because of this particular linkage a protein molecule can be formed. So they are linked by a peptide bond which is formed. How is this peptide bond formed? It is formed when the carboxyl group of one amino acid, I'll just take the example here. So amino acid at one end it has the carboxyl group and at the other end it has an amino group, right? So you can see here one end it has the amino group. This is the amino group NH2. So I'll write it here. It is the amino group. And on the other end, COOH, it is the carboxyl group. So, this is the carboxyl group. So, this is one amino acid. This is one amino acid. This is one more amino acid. Now, these two amino acids should be linked. How is it linked? We shall see. So, this is also one amino acid. How am I telling it is an amino acid? Because amino acid will always have at one end it will have the amino group. If you can see here, I'm talking about one more amino acid here. One end it will have the amino group and at one more end it will have the one end of the carbon will, will be connected to an amino group and the other end of the carbon molecule will be connected to a carboxyl group. Now this is an amino acid. By looking at the structure, I can say it is amino acid. Now these two amino acids should connect to each other. Only if they are linked to one another, they can form a long chain. Where, therefore, they can form a protein, right? So, how they can link? They can link by when the carboxyl group of one amino acid reacts with the amino group of the next amino acid with the elimination of water molecule, that is with the elimination of water means dehydration should take place. What is dehydration? Loss of water, right? So, here the carboxyl molecule should link with the amino molecule of the other amino acid. So here you can see this carboxyl group that is there, it will link with the amino group. So this is the one amino, first amino acid. This is the second amino acid. So the first amino acid's carboxyl group, it will link with the second amino acid's amino group, right? So when the linkage takes place, what happens? Water should be eliminated. So here, how will the linkage take place? Can you see here, this from this COOH, OH and this H will get eliminated. Therefore, water will get eliminated. This process is called as dehydration. Linkage takes place by dehydration. If you write, linkage takes place by dehydration is also correct because it is understood from the carboxyl group, the OH, and from the amino group, the H, that is water, together H2O water will get removed. That is dehydration will take place and the linkage will form. Can you see here now? CO and NH. They are linked now by a, this, that is how the peptide bond forms. So how does the peptide bond forms? The linkage occurs between the carboxyl group of one end of one of the amino acid 
and the amino group of the other amino acid a link a bond will be formed how will the bond be formed by the elimination of water or by dehydration the bond bond will be formed so what is the type of bond that is formed there it is nothing but the peptide bond so now again like that here also if there is one more amino acid that also again this carboxyl group will react with the amino group of this particular amino acid H and the linkage will form dehydration will take place linkage will form like that dehydration process will occur and occur and therefore long chains of amino acids will link together by peptide bond so that is how peptide bond is formed next talking about the glycosidic bond so glycosidic bond so glycosidic bond usually occurs in polysaccharides there are two types of polysaccharides right simple polysaccharides and complex polysaccharides if i take the example of simple polysaccharide say cellulose cellulose is a simple polysaccharide here it is a polymeric unit right it is made up of monomers of mon monosaccharide unit what is the monosaccharide unit there glucose right how are each of the glucose linked to one another it is linked by glycosidic bond how here peptide bonds help in the linkage of the amino acids to each other just like that in polysaccharides the monomer units or the monosaccharide units are linked to one another by the glycosidic Bond. So, in a polysaccharide, the individual monosaccharides are linked by a glycosidic bond. So, this bond also is formed by dehydration. What is dehydration? When the bonding between the two monosaccharide units occur, the loss of water will take place. So, when there is loss of water, the glycosidic bond will get formed there. So, this bond is also formed by dehydration. And how is this bond formed? It is formed between two carbon atoms of two adjacent monosaccharides. So, in a protein or how was the bonds formed? Here, one of the carboxyl group linked with the other amino acids amino group and dehydration took place and therefore peptide bond was formed. Here, both the monosaccharide units carbon atom will link with each other along with dehydration that is loss of water to form a glycosidic bond. So, we shall see here. So, here I have two monosaccharide units here. So, this is one monosaccharide unit, this is one monosaccharide unit. So, here what happens? Can you see here this and this? There is loss of water occurring H2O dehydration will occur once dehydration occurs here what happens this oxygen atom that is remaining it will form a glycosidic bond here so therefore the glycosidic bond will be formed between two monosaccharide unit this is one monosaccharide unit this is one monosaccharide unit this is the example of sucrose that I have taken here so, sucrose, this is how it is formed. So, what happens here? Between the carbon atoms. So, here between the carbon atoms, the bond will get formed in this particular case by the elimination of water. Water gets eliminated. That is dehydration will take place. So, that is how the bond is formed in this particular case between two monosaccharide units. So, next there is one more type of bond that is present which is called as the ester bond. So, ester bonds is usually seen in the nucleotides that is either the deoxyribonucleotide or the ribonucleotide. In the nucleic acid usually ester bonds are formed either in a DNA or in a RNA. So, here in a nucleic acid I told you it is made up of three components that is it is made up of a heterocyclic component, it is made up of a sugar component and it is made up of a phosphate group component or a phosphate molecule right in a nucleic acid a phosphate moiety or a phosphate components links with the three carbon of one sugar so it is made up of a sugar either it is made up of a pento sugar or it is made up of a deoxyribose sugar right so you can see here the phosphate group how can you say it is a phosphate group phosphate the chemical formula for phosphate it is PO4 right so this is phosphate so phosphate group I have here we have a sugar molecule 
So therefore, it is made up of three components. One component is the heterocyclic component. Heterocyclic, it is cyclic in nature. It is made up of a nitrogenous base that is adenine. Here again, I have taken the example of adenine. It can be anything. It can be guanine, cytosine or thymine as well. If it is a DNA, if it is a RNA, it can be adenine, guanine, cytosine or uracil, right? Here I have taken this. One component is the nitrogenous base component or the heterocyclic component the other component is the sugar and the other component is the phosphate so here what happens the phosphate moiety that is there this particular phosphate molecule that is there it links to the three carbon of one of the sugar so you can see here the sugar it is a pento sugar it is linked to the carbon to the carbon group it is linked to the carbon group so it is linked to the 5 carbon. So 5 prime carbon. Why? Because this is 1, this is 2, 3, 4 and 5. So to the 5 prime carbon actually this is linked. It is linked to the 5 prime carbon and of the sugar to the succeeding nucleotide and also to the nucleotide. It is linked to the, the phosphate group is linked to the 5 prime carbon and it is linked to the succeeding nucleotide as well. So the bond between the phosphate and the hydroxyl group of sugar is called as the ester bond. So you can see here that bond that is formed with the, with the hydroxyl group of the sugar and that of the phosphate group it is called as the ester bond. So as there is one such ester bond on either side, it is called as the phosphodiester bond. Can you see here, on either side, there is an ester bond being formed. Why? One side, it is linked to the phosphate group and the other side, it is linked to a nitrogenous base or it is linked to a heterocyclic ring. Therefore, it is called as a phosphodiester bond. So, this is on either side, it is called as the phosphodiester bond. So, this is about the ester bond. So, ester bond are usually helps in the linking of the phosphate group to the one of the carbon molecules of the sugar. So therefore formed between the phosphate group and the hydroxyl group of sugar it is called as the ester bond and since two such bonds are formed it is called as the phosphodiester bond. So next since we know about the proteins what they are made up of, we know about the polysaccharides, what they are made up of, what are the bonds that are present with, between them and since we also know about the nucleic acids or the nitrogenous bases and how they are linked to one another, what is the kind of bond that is present between them or what are the three components they are made up of because we know about all that now, we can study about the structure of the nucleic acid that is the secondary structure of the nucleic acid. So, the secondary structure of nucleic acid can be studied using the Watson-Crick model. So, Watson and Crick, two scientists, they were the ones who told the world about the proper structure of the DNA, how exactly the DNA looks like. Otherwise, if you just see inside the cell, you can see the DNA as coiled structures like this. But actually, it looks like a helical structure like this. So, therefore, this particular helical structure of DNA was first discovered by Watson and Crick. Therefore, DNA, the structure of or the secondary structure of the nucleic acid, especially the DNA, is explained based on the Watson and Crick model. So, we shall study what this Watson and Crick model is. What was the explanation given by these two scientists? So, they said that DNA occurs as a double helix. Co correct, right? It has two helices, but Therefore, it is a double helix. It is a helix because they are coiled. So, these structures are nothing but they are coiled like this, like this they are coiled. So, they exist as double helix. This is one strand of the DNA. This is the second strand of the DNA. They are made up of two strands and they are helical in nature. They are coiled in nature. Therefore, the DNA exists as double helix and the two strands of the polynucleotides. Why are they polynucleotides? They are made up of different nucleotide units, right? They are made up of adenine, which is linked to a phosphate group and a sugar group. They are again made up of guanine, cytosine, thymine, like this. They are made up of chains of nucleotides. That is why they are two strands of polynucleotides. They are anti-parallel to one another. They are anti-parallel. Why? Because they are coiled in nature. They are anti-parallel and they run in the opposite direction. So, 
they are made up of two strands the two strands are coiled to each other they are anti parallel in nature and they are run in opposite direction that is phi prime so one of the strand so this particular strand right runs in opposite direction why because this runs from phi prime to 3 prime direction and the other one runs from 3 prime to 5 prime direction so that is why they run in two opposite direction and therefore they are anti parallel to each other and the backbone of dna is formed by the sugar phosphate phosphorus is the backbone of the dna the sugar phosphate why it is a sugar phosphate because always the sugar component is always linked to the phosphate group as well as it is linked to the nitrogenous base group or the heterocyclic group so you can see here they are double stranded they are helical in nature one runs from the 5 prime to the 3 prime direction and the other one runs from the it is in the opposite direction therefore they are anti parallel and they are oppositely arranged to each other and if you see a small portion of this particular strand you can see that they are made up of a phosphate group and they are made up of a heterocyclic ring heterocyclic ring and you can see thymine thymine always pairs with adenine so thymine always pairs with adenine and it is held by two hydrogen bonds whereas guanine always pairs with cytosine and it is held by three hydrogen bonds so this is the rule of the watson and crick model according to them they said that at time adenine always base pairs with thymine and cytosine say for example i'll tell you here there are two strands so if in one of the strand if it is adenine here it should always be thymine if this is thymine this is always be adenine if this is guanine this is always be cytosine so they are held by two bonds two bonds here again three bonds and this if this is cytosine it will always pair with guanine this is how the arrangement always takes place so here this thymine will be attached to a phosphate group this is nothing but a heterocyclic ring thymine it will be attached to a phosphate group and it will also be attached to a sugar molecule therefore the backbone of dna is made up of a sugar phosphate wherein it is made up of a sugar molecule attached to a phosphate group so this is about the structure and the nitrogenous bases are projected more or less perpendicular to this backbone but faces inside so here they are facing inside so i can show you again here these are two helical structures of dna one is the 5 prime end and other one is the 3 prime end this is the 3 prime end and the other one is the 5 prime end now here i told you adenine it is facing towards the inside adenine base pairs with thymine with two hydrogen bonds guanine base pairs with cytosine with three hydrogen bonds these are facing towards the inside but towards the outside they are made up of a phosphate group and a sugar molecules that is why because they are facing towards the outside just like us a backbone faces towards the outside of a body right here also these fo sugar phosphate group they face towards the outside of the dna molecule that is why it is called as the backbone of the dna whereas the nucleic acids that is the adenine thymine guanine and cytosine they are placed towards the inner side of the nuclear dna molecule so they that is dna molecule therefore they are placed towards the inner side so but they face towards the inner side inner to the backbone they face towards the inner side so this is the structure so next they also said that the adenine and guanine of one strand compulsorily it should base pair with thymine and cytosine what it means that they said that adenine should always base pair with thymine if it is dna if it was rna it will base pair with uracil that is different here i'm talking about dna and guanine always base pairs with cytosine this is the rule it is like this adenine cannot base pair with cytosine neither thymine with guanine no it will not take place like that adenine always will base pair with it pairs with thymine that is if this is the dna strand i've just drawn like this adenine if it is present on one strand the other strand will have thymine if one strand has guanine the other strand will have cytosine always the base pairing should be like that and 
between adenine and thymine there are two hydrogen bonds being present can you see here one hydrogen bond the second one but in the case of guanine and cytosine here two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine and three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine so between guanine and cytosine you can see one two three one bond the second bond and the third bond three bonds will hold together what are the bonds hydrogen bonds so how are they held together ester bonds forms a connectivity between the nucleic acid that is any one of the nucleic acid with that of the phosphate group and the sugar group okay but the nucleic acids are held to together to each other by hydrogen bonds so therefore hydrogen bonds also play a major role in giving a helical nature to the dna or help in coiling of the dna and each strand appears like a helical staircase that is why they help in coiling because these bonds and if these bonds are broken down then the strands actually dna strands will be like this why are they held together like this because it is because of the hydrogen bond these hydrogen bonds that are formed now if this hydrogen bond is not there the strands will start to separate and they will become linear like this so that is why hydrogen bonds are very very important there and at each step the strand turns at 36 degree so 36 degree a so there is a helical so each step say for example here there is a turn here there is a turn the turn is in 360 degree angle the 360 degree angle turn is there and one full turn of the helical strand would involve 10 steps of 10 base pairs it means that one particular turn so i told you one turn one helix like this one helix again one turn like this one helix like again one turn so this turn has about 10 nucleotides 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and 10 nucleotides so after 10 nucleotides the turn will occur here again after 10 nucleotides the turn will occur again here after 10 nucleotides the turn will occur so the 360 degree turn 360 degree angle turn always occurs after 10 nucleotides after 10 10 nucleotides these nucleotides can be anything adenine guanine cytosine thymine again thymine adenine guanine like this after 10 nucleotides these turns will occur and each step it is represented by pair of bases that is pair of bases why pair of bases i'm telling here is there is one more helical structure here right so here pair base that is your thymine again here cytosine again here guanine then thymine then adenine then cytosine base pairing pairs are there one pair here one pair one pair one pair pairs are there therefore they form 10 base pairs after 10 base pairs the coiling will occur so as i told you after 10 base pairs the coiling will occur as i've drawn here in the diagram so these were the observations made by watson and crick that is why even today watson and crick model of dna is used to explain the structure of the dna so next talking about the one more type of DNA based on the coiling. So here there are some DNAs wherein the pitch is 34 degree angle. So I told you in generally in the DNA the coil and coiling angle is 36 degree 36 A that is 36 angle. But there are some uh, DNA helices wherein the coiling occurs in 34 A angle is 34a so such dnas are called as the bdna so there are different types of dna but in puc the bdna is one of the important one that they have given so we have a dna z dna and all that but it is enough if we know about the bdna for the for puc so bdna so bdna the only difference is everything what i explained about watson and crick model is same there there also there is double helix everything 10 base pair everything is same but the only difference is in that coiling, no, that angle, there it was 36 degree angle, the coiling would occur at 36 degree pitch or 36 degree angle. But here at 34 degree angle, the coiling will occur. So that is the difference. This coiling, it will occur at 34 degree. So that is the difference. So this is about B DNA. So I hope you understood the session wherein we discussed about the bonds especially in today's session we discussed about the different types of bonds that actually help say if it is a um, if the bond is formed between amino acids it is a peptide bond if it is between 
the monosaccharide units in the case of polysaccharides it is a glycosidic bond and in the case of nucleic acids if the bond that is formed which forms a connectivity between the heterocyclic compound the sugar and the phosphate group it is a ester bond and also we studied about the structure of the dna based on the watson and crick model wherein i told you dna is a double helical structure it is made up of nitrogenous bases and the different uh, and how the bonds are formed between the nitrogenous bases what angle the coiling occurs how, after how many base pairs the coiling of the dna will take place all that we studied in today's session and in the next coming session we shall discuss about the enzymes so what are the functions what are the structure of the different types of enzymes their role in the uh, organisms all that we shall study in the coming session so i hope you understood the session very well we shall meet again in the coming session thank you